Dan, um, I'm going to ask you if you can, before we, before we jump into the, um, the approved budget for fiscal year 2021, um, obviously the major news is the Supreme Court ruling and what that means for the business community going forward. As I said, um, we kind of did a recap a couple of minutes ago. Um, get, I'm sure you probably didn't get much rest over the weekend. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Um, what insight can you give us this morning on uh, how this ruling is going to impact the business community moving forward on a statewide level? Well, I think it's going to spread a lot of confusion. Um, if I can say anything from my experience so far, given the Supreme Court ruling, it's that nobody really knows uh, what to do or how to respond. Uh, so that's created a lot of problems, but that's not a problem we're not used to. Uh, they, you know, the governor's orders um, were, you know, complicated and hard to interpret and constantly changing. So, um, you know, it's it's kind of par for the course. We've uh, we've experienced a lot of confusion since the beginning of COVID back in March, uh, and the Supreme Court uh, ruling really turned everything upside down. So, and our, you know, and we and you know, Ron, to be honest too, we're still. Um, dissecting the, the ruling, trying to talk to as many folks as we can. I've uh, been in communication with some major, you know, law firms, Warner Norcross, Bodman, and uh, they have the same response. You know, they're they're reviewing it, they're they're taking a look at it, and they'll get back to everybody this week. Uh, I would say that the uh, the governor keeps commenting a lot about this 21 days, and um, I, I I don't think that that's um, actually true. I think all of her executive orders as of Friday at 4.35 p.m. Are, uh, are null and void, anyone that was issued after April 30th. Uh, so she could um, ask for a rehearing, but there's no rule or law that would require a Supreme Court ruling to kind of stay um, until she decides to rehear it or not. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where we're at. I mean, I, I think I got a lot of calls over the weekend from legislative leaders in the House and Senate you know, asking which executive order should be codified and if any should be changed. And uh, that's going to be a big endeavor. I think the legislature had planned on, um, you know, cutting loose for election season last week, but I think they're going to be back in town to do a lot of heavy lifting in the next couple of days. So we'll see how it evolves. Um, if, if there's any specific questions I can try to answer, I'd be happy to, but, you know, to be honest, we're we're really trying to, we're focusing on the legislative process and what executive orders should be codified around unemployment or liability protections, things like that. And, uh, and then also try to figure out what, um, what businesses should do, what, what should they, should they enforce masks? Should they enforce the 50% capacity limits at restaurants, for example? Uh, we're trying to figure that one out. Yeah. Um, you know, I, obviously I, I, you know, obviously a, a majority of, businesses are very concerned about keeping the public safe, uh, protecting their customers, protecting their workforce. Um, so, so moving forward, I, I would imagine, like I said, a majority of businesses are going to continue um, to, to practice safe measures. Uh, of course, we, we saw information coming out from um, Myosha over the weekend, and a lot of these um, workplace safeguard measures, uh, they're saying, are still uh, are still in place. Um, and there was some, uh, you know, information coming out about Myosha still enforcing some of these measures. Um, and of course, we saw uh, one of the representatives from Myosha said that the the, um, uh, the the fines that came out last week are still being enforced. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about, um, and I know this, a lot of these might be tough questions because we're still trying to assess the situation. Um, what, what is still in place in terms of MIOSHA um, and do they have the um, ability to continue to enforce that in light of the Supreme Court ruling? Yeah, so at this point, I would say if you, if you receive a MIOSHA violation and you fight it, the Attorney General is going to be representing MIOSHA on that case and they're not enforcing anything so you know while my OSHA might try to issue a you know a, a fine I, I don't think they will to be honest because I don't think they I think they know at the end of the day that if anybody fights them on it they're going to lose um, but I, I think my OSHA can can try and say they're going to enforce certain provisions within their act but is the attorney general going to come down and and enforce that if it's challenged she said no so it's it's uh it's definitely a little complicated. And then the other question, you know, Ron, too, is, uh, you know, Myosha had made those statements, and then also the local 
county health departments. Mm -hmm. And I just think that, you know, the local county health departments issue a lot of, a lot of mandates. Those are going to get challenged too. I think that uh, attorneys are kind of empowered now to question these, these orders. And the Supreme Court ruling will be kind of the, uh, the thing that everybody looks to when they're responding to local health department orders as well. You know, that's a, that's a good point, Dan. And, and that's, um, it's going to be very uh, interesting, I think, to see what direction, uh, you, you know, our, our state goes in following this. And, and, and talking about local um, health orders, um, we, we, I mentioned this in the intro um, uh, with Wayne County. Uh, our county executive, Warren Evans, issued a statement on Sunday um, and, and he's, he's strongly encouraging a regional approach. Um, they, they haven't issued any new public health orders for Wayne County, uh, but he's, uh, uh, he's urging the legislature and the governor um, to work together uh, based on science and facts to, to put together a solid approach uh, to protect our business community and our entire um, region moving forward. So, so Wayne County hasn't issued any new orders, uh, but Oakland County has. Uh, Ingham County has. Um, so, and, and I believe they're issuing these orders based on uh, public health code. Um, so, so it's going to be very interesting to see if those will be challenged. Um, do you have any insight on what kind of limited authority local health, uh, county health departments have to issue these kinds of orders and how long would they remain in, in effect until, in, until they're canceled? Yeah, Brad, I wish I had a better answer, but it, uh, I think that I think it will evolve. I think we'll start to see what kind of authority they have and, and who challenges them. You know, I can say in Ingham County, for example, some of these forced quarantines, you know, I, I don't think that anybody can force anybody else to stay in their house except for uh, acquiring essential items. But that hasn't been challenged. I mean, I don't think that you can, you know, basically uh, put someone under house arrest uh, through the public health code. Uh, but other things, you know, with a mask inside, is someone going to really challenge that? You know, I'm not sure. Is someone going to even have an opportunity to challenge it? Because are they actually going to get a ticket or a fine uh, for not complying? I don't know. You know, we, we did see the, uh, the county sheriffs and the local police chiefs, uh, their two organizations, and said, look at the attorney general that said they're not enforcing, so we're not either. So who's going to enforce the public health code? Mm -hmm. County sheriff? You know, it doesn't sound like it. Yeah, the, the next question is, Dan, on a state level, um, of course, the governor has said that she will be looking at alternative um, uh, authorities to issue new, new orders. Um, does, does, does that mean the, the, the Department of Health and Human Services? I mean, do you have any insight on what the governor may do moving forward? Yeah, that's, so that's a good question. And I do think Director Gordon will start issuing some of your executive directives through his authority within the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and like, you know, a recent example was when the governor, um, through the Department of Health and Human Services, through Director Gordon, banned flavored uh, liquid nicotine. And she had issued that as a public health emergency, but she lost that in the court too. Uh, the court said that she, that depart the department and the executive branch didn't have the authority to issue that uh, executive directive. So it, I think... I think she will, without question, issue orders through DHHS. Uh, but again, I don't know if those will stand. The, the problem is it'll, it'll just create a new legal battle that will take months to decide. And depending on which judge and, you know, if, a, if there's a, a stay or a preliminary injunction that's uh, along with it, you know, we could be looking at another several months before we see the constitutionality of certain DHHS orders. Yeah. Obviously, the biggest question right now right now to wrap up this conversation is um, we're, we're getting from especially smaller employers. Uh, the question is, what do we do? I mean, are we supposed to continue to follow the executive orders? You know, what, are we going to receive fines from IOSHA and from state uh, enforcers if, if we don't? I mean, that, that's the big question. What What is the Michigan Chamber telling the business community right now on what to do in the near future? Yeah. So I would say exercise extreme common sense. Um, you know, if you're a restaurant, there's going to be no bigger um, blow to your business than a COVID outbreak. So just be really smart. Um, I think it's if we're probably urging people to err on the side of, of uh, 
you know, worst case scenarios. Uh, if you're a restaurant, you start jamming people in and uh, you know, bringing back the DJ and disregarding social distances and occupancy limits, and you get hit with a huge COVID outbreak, I mean, your business could probably close. You know, we saw that here in East Lansing with Harper's. I mean, that made national news. Yeah. That business has been closed ever since then and will likely uh, never reopen. So I think the, the biggest thing that we'd stress is, use, is to use common sense. I think that when you look at polling as well, there's a lot of um, anxiety out there in the general public. So I think that if you want people to frequent your establishment, you're going to also have to show that you're doing your best to keep your patrons safe so that people feel comfortable um, going to your, your place of business. So hopefully by the end of the week, we'll have a lot more uh, concrete advice to provide. But at this point, I think it's, you know, just exercise common sense. Right. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. And again, I, I understand um, we're still trying to assess the situation, so it's tough to get into the details. Um, but I appreciate that uh, conversation. Um, and we're going we're gonna to turn it over to the committee uh, a little bit later on into the meeting. Um, but I do want to go ahead and shift over to uh, our original plans uh, discussion, which uh, was the uh, state's fiscal year 2021 budget, uh, which was uh, obviously uh, big news last week. Um, as the uh, governor signed uh, the, the new budget, which refunded uh, many different important programs and initiatives like the Peer Michigan Campaign, uh, like the Girl Going Pro Talent Fund. Um, so, so, Dan, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And, and again, you are able to share your screen. If you'd like to uh, dive into that and give us a, a good overview on what's uh, included in that, uh, in that budget and how that's going to impact businesses. All right. So yeah, big news, um, and luckily it didn't make too much news. It was actually a pretty smooth process, so we can be thankful for that uh, regarding next year's budget, given the unprecedented um, times of uncertainty and, and disruption. So, um, you know, I, so as as Ron had said, you know, I had planned to provide a background on the uh, overview of the 2021 budget. Um, obviously, since Friday, we've been talking about the priorities and everybody's interests have shifted towards the Supreme Court case. But um, a brief introduction, I am the Director of Tax Policy and Regulatory Affairs here at the Michigan Chamber. About 80% of my time has spent on tax issues and about 20% on miscellaneous regulatory items. Um, so for example, an energy and environmental, an energy or an environmental regulation would be covered by my colleague, Michael Imo, but something like a data breach uh, requirements or alcohol regulations uh, they kind of, they fall with me. So where issues regulatory issues don't fit in anybody else's bucket, they they end up in mine. So I've been here for about three years, and I spent one year with a different uh, trade association. Uh, they are now called the Midwest Independent Retailers Association, and that was made up of independent grocers, gas stations, um, liquor stores, convenience stores. Uh, when I worked there, they were called the Associated Food and Petroleum Dealers. Uh, and before that, I spent six years working. Uh, for the Senate Finance Chairman, and during that time we saw a lot of major tax policy reform, uh, like the elimination of the Michigan business tax and major reforms to personal property tax for manufacturers. So it was lucky to have a front row seat at all those major reforms as Governor Snyder came into office and uh, my then boss, Senator Brandenburg from Macomb County, uh, chair of the Finance Committee, and I worked for him for uh, six years. And uh, before that, I'm a MSU grad, so go green. I just want to comment really quick uh, and thank Ron again for the opportunity to speak with, with all of you. Um, I can tell you that the uh, Chamber Federation is, is, is extremely strong. You know, when you combine the work at the local level with organizations like the South, Southern Wayne County Regional Chamber, with the Michigan Chamber's work at the state level, and the U.S. Chamber's work in Washington, D.C., we can create a really powerful voice for, for our members across the, the, uh, across the country, you know, from, from D.C. to Main Street. So I, I want to recognize... Um, the Federation and, the and just again thank Ron for the invitation and again say that I appreciate you know the opportunity working with the Southern Wayne County Regional Chamber and uh, it's one of the best to work with and I don't say that to every local chamber I present to so uh, thanks again Ron. Um, so let's let's talk about we can't talk about the 2021 budget without talking about some of the events that led up to the budget. Um, so so let's start back in January 10th of this year uh, during what we, we, during the Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference. And the CREEC is a 
uh, it's the it's a group of people that come together to estimate state revenues in order to help policymakers create a budget. So the CREC is made up of the House Fiscal Agency Economists, the Senate Fiscal Agency Economists, and the Department of Treasury Economists. They all each individually come up with revenue projections for the upcoming fiscal year, and they come together and they end up smushing all those kind of estimates together to create one consensus revenue estimate. And in January 10th, the consensus revenue estimate had shown unemployment should be about 3.8% for this fiscal year. Revenues for the general fund and school aid fund were strong. And again, in case anybody doesn't know, the general fund uh, revenue uh, funds, you know, everything but schools. Uh, so you can think about it pretty simply. The school aid fund, uh, it, it funds K-12, community colleges and higher ed, and the general fund covers everything else. And when we're talking about these revenues, we're not ta we're talking about state tax revenues. We're not talking about any kind of federal money. So this is money that the legislature and the governor can, can are free to appropriate. Uh, so the CREC showed again a 1.7% increase in revenues for the general fund and a 2.8 increase in revenues for the school aid fund, um, which combined projected total revenue at 25 and a half billion. And if you, on the right, you can see the long-term estimates where we continued back in January, we were assuming continued growth in both the general fund and the school aid fund of uh, pretty significant numbers. So now May hits and uh, the CREC, they meet every January and every May. Um, so May comes and this is two months after COVID. So the um, projections started to look a little bit less positive. Uh, in May, the consensus revenue estimates show that unemployment would be about 12.7% 12, 12 this fiscal year. And then we could see the general fund and school aid fund revenues were going to be decreasing by about $3.1 billion. So any and all work that was taking place on the budget back from January till May had to drastically change. The legislature and the governor need to work together to, to cut what they thought was going to be about $3.1 billion in, uh, in revenues. And you can, can, on the right, you can continue to see, you know, the long-term projections showed pretty good growth. Um, that, that was still encouraging that we would see um, growth after the dip because of COVID. Now, because of the uncertainty, the, legislator, the, the legislature and the governor had asked for another consensus revenue estimating conference in August. Uh, you know, COVID was in full force now and and the thought was that we could have better predictors of what revenues the state would have for fiscal year 2021 come August. And we, things did start to look a little bit better. Better, You know, unemployment was still gonna be projected to be very high, which is discouraging. But we did see uh, general fund and school aid fund revenues come in a little bit stronger and the projections showed they'd continue to come in strong. So instead of cutting about 3 billion, they only had to cut about 1 billion. But what's really concerning is that uh, chart on the right, you can see that general fund and school aid fund, well, especially general fund growth is supposed is going to be flat. That's very concerning. Um, things uh, don't look to be getting much better in the long run. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the challenges for fiscal year 2022 uh, later on. But to recap, the, the budget, you know, policymakers were Looking at a budget back in January that looked really good, uh, and they were looking at revenues about 25 and a half billion. August showed revenues were going to be declining pretty significantly because of COVID uh, to 23 billion, and the final budget came in at 23 billion dollars, uh, general fund and school aid fund. Um, if you look, notice that the legislature and the governor did spend a little bit more on the school aid fund that, than we thought would be coming in, which is okay. That's allowable, but let's just hope that we don't have to do a negative supplemental. Uh, budget to cut funding uh, if that revenue doesn't come to fruition mid mid fiscal year. So let's hope that doesn't happen, but you know it very well could because they spent about eight hundred million dollars more than they thought they were going to be bringing in. Um, so this fiscal year in total spending, now this includes federal spending like um, Medicaid, federal transportation dollars, and all state tax revenues. So in total, the the twenty twenty one budget. Um, will be 62.7 billion. And you can see how that breaks down between the school aid fund and the general fund. Um, and luckily, instead of the $3 billion in cuts, we only had to, uh, the legislature only had to cut 
a billion and the governor only had a got a billion. And a, a lot of this was repurposing federal money. Luckily, we did get significant federal resources we were able to repurpose uh, for the 2021 budget. There's only about $250 million in cuts spread across basically all state agencies, uh, mostly the Department of Correction. And then um, there was some carryover. You'll see later on that the legislature had to make a mid-year supplemental for the 20 budget that cut a lot of spending. So there was some, some carryover from the rainy day fund that was spent and some other priorities in, in the 20 budget. Um, and, and part of the reason why project the projections got a little bit better, you know, we, we were only instead of a $3 billion cut, we're looking at a, a $1 billion cut. It's because of a lot of the federal stimulus. The $600 in bonus unemployment um, really um, crutched up consumer spending and confidence. So we continue to see people spending money. We saw sales tax revenue. The $600 in bonus unemployment will be taxed uh, with, with state income tax. So we saw those revenues continue to be strong. Uh, we also saw the PPP loan funding, you know, that cut people on payroll that make more money than they would on unemployment. So we continue to get those income tax revenues and those people continue to spend money. So <clears throat> because of, um, you know, significant federal stimulus, uh, I think that really helped us here on the state level. Um, so let's get into a couple of the highlights uh, that Ron had mentioned too, that I thought would be pertinent to the business community in the 2021 budget. Uh, first and foremost, the legislature was uh, allow, but the legislature and the governor uh, maintain the $600 million in general funds spending for roads. That was part of the 2017 road funding compromise. And um, we, we were very excited to see that the general fund money that could have been used for anything else uh, was continued to be prioritized for road funding. So we're happy that the $600 million uh, will continue to go to roads. Uh, the reconnect program, so that's, a, that's an upskilling program. That's a priority of the governor. There is uh, $30 million appropriated to that. And that's, um, that covers skilled training and certificates for residents 25 and older who do not have a college degree. Uh, it's part of the governor's 60 by 30 goal. That goal is that 60% of Michigan residents are in a post-secondary certificate or degree by 2030. Uh, and that's, that's, um, that's good for a lot of different reasons. You know, it's good for the, the, talent, pipe, the talent shortage we're looking at, workforce development. Um, you know, the governor modeled this program after uh, a successful program, I believe, in Tennessee. Uh, and she's really latched onto this. And it's something excited because it's something that uh, we really needed prior to COVID when we were having severe work short workforce challenges. Uh, the governor had included $110 million for this program originally. The legislature had appropriated $35 million. But like I had mentioned earlier, all funding for this program was eliminated for the fiscal year 2020 supplemental due to the, the, needed, the need to cut spending because of COVID. Um, of the revenue shortfalls that we saw with last fiscal year's budget um so we're excited that for 2021 we will have at least you know 30 million dollars to get this program up and running and that should get um that should give us a good idea on how it works you know i think we'll be able to is the 30 million dollars this fiscal year and see how many people were able to uh, go back to school uh, attain a certificate degree increase their earning potential uh, and so forth so the reconnect program is a good one i would suggest uh, looking into that if anybody has uh, an interest. Uh, also mentioned was the Going Pro Talent Fund. Uh, $28.7 million this fiscal year was appropriated for the Going Pro uh, program. Um, and I included this chart on the right just to show how the, uh, the Going Pro money has been awarded to businesses. You can see it focuses on small and medium sized businesses uh, to recruit and train the workforce they need uh, to be successful. So the, the, the fund, uh, so this is a little bit different. As opposed to the Reconnect program where you go back to like a community college or trade school, this fund is actually a grant program that goes to employers to do what they want with it. They create their own training program and the state helps fund that. So it's, it's really more, con it's more employer controlled, employer based as opposed to uh, community college based. Um, so this, so again, an, an employer could apply for this, this money and and uh, use it to develop training programs to retain and hire the people they need. Uh, this program was eliminated la uh, last year over the budget fight um, that occurred over the gas tax increase the governor proposed. If you recall, the, the governor had proposed a 45 cent increase to the gas tax, which is above and beyond our 19 cent per gallon gas tax currently. Uh, the legislature sent her a budget without that increase, without the 45 cents, and she started to veto a lot of 
legislative priorities of the House and Senate, and one of them was going pro. Now, this was kind of an unconventional and worked out to be an unsuccessful approach to bring legislators back to the table to, to, to impose a 45 cent gas tax. Um, but regardless, it, it didn't work out. It got a little messy. She vetoed the funding. It was restored. And then it was eliminated again because of COVID. Uh, but it's back now. It's uh, $28.7 million. So we're really excited that that funding was there um, for employers to tap into. Um, the last highlight was the Pure Michigan funding. Uh, so the 2021 budget contains $15 million of state revenues for uh, Pure Michigan. That's obviously the, the marketing campaign that, back in, that, was, that began back in 2008 uh, to, promote the Michigan, to promote Michigan's tourism ministry. Uh, there was previously appropriated $37 million, so Pure Michigan did see a pretty big cut. Uh, we'll probably see less commercials, less billboards, um, but at least it's not totally eliminated. Uh, the governor vetoed this funding uh, last fiscal year as well as part of that same budget fight I mentioned over the gas tax. Uh, but it was subsequent, subsequently re restored, but then eliminated again mid-year because of COVID. Uh, so you can see a lot of the priorities that we were talking about, Pure Michigan, Going Pro, Reconnect, had seen a pretty, pretty, um, pretty tumultuous history. Uh, but luckily, I think uh, we've all learned that uh, the budget is not a real good political tool. I think even you see in, in Washington, D.C., when the, when the president argues with Congress over how to spend money and there's, you know, budget shutdowns, there's no win there. There's no win for, the, for Congress or the president. And I think the governor learned and the legislature learned as well that there's no win at the state level either for a big budget to bite, to, uh, fight. People want the budget to be wrapped up. There's a balanced budget amendment. There's a job to do. Just get it done. People don't want to see it used as a political tool. Uh, and I think we've now seen that with the 2021 budget. This budget was extremely, extremely smooth. It was the dullest budget process I've ever experienced in Lansing in 10 years. It's a very plain, vanilla, basic budget, um, which is good. It, you know, there's small increases to schools, uh, small increases for local government revenue sharing, and um, it showed there was immense cooperation. And, and oddly enough, it was one of the most secretive budgets I've ever followed in my time here in Lansing as well. I didn't see the, the real specific budget in, for, in t on, it was about a Monday and it was sent to the governor's desk by the end of the week. So, I mean, and you know, I think a lot of people were upset about that, but at the end of the day, um, it, the budget's done and priorities were funded. Um, no scary cuts were made and you know, it worked out well. So I, I think at the end of the day, it might have been a little bit secretive. We would have liked to see a more transparent process, but you know, it, it worked out. So that's some of my commentary on the 2021 budget. And just really quick, um, a slide on the 22 budget. Work has already begun in the 2022 budget. The timeline is, uh, is spelled out here. Uh, you know, come January, we'll see another consensus revenue estimating conference. Uh, in February, early February, the governor will put out her executive budget uh, recommendations to the legislature and the legislature will begin working on that and then may we double check to make sure revenues are where they thought we would see them in january and then june we should see the, the budget wrapped up um, but there's going to be big trouble ahead we're already looking at a two billion dollar shortfall now remember we we shifted a lot of priority a lot of federal spending we mixed that into the 2020 2021 year budgets to smooth it out um, but what a consequence of that is that we really pushed a lot of things down the road. So we're looking at a potentially a $2 billion shortfall for 2022 and projected unemployment at this rate right now is, 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 um, is supposed to be about 7.7%. So nowhere near the 3.4% we saw last January, uh, January of 2020. Uh, and again, if you remember that general fund projected growth is, spe is expected to be basically flat. So the 2022 year budget, uh, luckily we have a lot more time, you know, the 2021 year's budget's done. Work will begin immediately on, on next year's budget, which is important given the challenges that uh, we're, we're predicting. So that's kind of a, a high point on the budget. Um, Ryan, I don't know if there's questions or if uh, you want to open it up, but that's kind of a, a brief summary on next fiscal year's budget. Yeah, Dan, thank you so much. That was a phenomenal overview of the budget. We're very grateful for that.